Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joanne Aaron Sibia, and I'm Head of Marketing and Communications at AFTA. And I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining on joining us today on July 30. We're you know almost in August, and I can't believe that NTIA was over a week ago now. Today we've got a well two special guests from Risk Logic. RiskLogic is a leading provider of resilient services. And what that means is that they are experts in the areas of crisis management, crisis communication, incident management, business continuity, and cyber consulting. So they provide expert advice and consulting, consulting services, technology solutions, and training to help businesses in the areas that I mentioned. And in fact, I actually heard them talk at a Cato crisis event and just thought that the content would be so relevant and useful for our travel agents that I invited them along here uh, today to speak to you. So please welcome Tim Archer, who's Head of Communications at RiskLogic, and also Simon Peaty, who's the New South Wales, Queensland and ACT Regional Manager. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Joe. Hello. <laughs> So they're going to introduce you to crisis management and key considerations for your business. They're probably going to talk for around 40 minutes um, and then at the end, if we've got any questions, I'm going to help facilitate that. So feel free to use the question and answer toolbox to type in any questions that you might have and we'll do our best to address those. We're going to record this webinar, so it will be on our website if any of your colleagues haven't been able to make it on the webinar today. And then, of course, you're all going to get a survey at the end of this, and we'd really appreciate it if you told us how much you enjoyed the survey. So I'm going to hand it over to the guys now. All right. Thanks, Joe. Um, so good morning. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this is Simon Petty speaking. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague, Tim Archer, shortly. Um, but we are going to talk about crisis management, what that looks like. Um, for those um, of you, I know I met Joe at the Cato conference, um, but the, the underlying concept around crisis incident emergency management um, within the travel industry is it's one of the few organizations or industries that we actually do work in where it's not about if this will happen. It is, it is genuinely about when the next event will happen. And for you as, as agents or um, you as professionals who are facilitating travel of others, it's about whether any of your um, customers, clients, or your own staff are involved. And I'm sure there's been multiple people that are sitting on the call at the moment who have had near misses or have had clients overseas in, um, in situations where um, they've either just missed or been really close to events that have occurred. So from all the industries that we work, uh, work with, the reason why we're really passionate about bringing crisis management to the travel industry is you're the ones that are going to be using it more often than not. So to kick off um, today's webinar, what I thought we'd um, discuss is where it all even fits um, and where does crisis management, incident management actually fit in the spectrum of um, responding to a critical event. And if you refer to the screen in front of you, you can see that, um, and I like to call this the, the haystacks, but we start over on the left hand side, which is the concept of our emergency management. So if you are a, a travel provider and there has been an event that involves customers or, or a, as I said before, your staff, this is absolutely about the preservation of life and property. Within your industry in particular, this is where there is absolutely a delegation or a responsibility um, for people to protect the life and property and a lot of the time you don't have control over that. One of the things for the travel agents that are in uh, that are listening today that I'd like to, to really drill in on is in the emergency management phase, you need to have absolute trust and faith that the customers that you're servicing, that you're putting onto these trips, are going to be looked after by those organisations, resorts or functions, uh, wherever you've sent them, and that they're, um, the, the places that you're sending them, um, if they are staying there and you've organised it, have the emergency management locked away. When we're talking about you as an organisation, all of a sudden we're going to take that step back and think about the next phase, which is the incident and crisis management phase. Now you'll notice down the bottom axis there when we talk about the event happening, so that flash or the bang, and then start to move that along the time scale. And you can see that there's a gap between emergency management occurring and incident and crisis management starting to kick in. And that's because it's going to take time for the event to unravel for you to actually understand exactly what it is that's happened 
And as we've seen from events recently, and I'll talk through a couple of case studies, but when we've talked through um, events recently, it actually takes time for you to actually ascertain whether or not your people, be the staff or customers, are even involved. And when you start to get that information, that's when your effort starts to really ramp up. As that information becomes available and you un understand what the immediate impact or potential impact could be to those particular people or the event or your future business if you're starting to predict forward. The next phase as we start to move through and that um, incident and crisis management is about stabilizing the particular event and mitigating against it getting any worse. So communicating clearly, which is what Tim's gonna talk about, but also starting to put um, actions and tasks in place to uh, not just mitigate, but solve the problem. And then eventually we're gonna be handing over to, to business continuity. And business continuity is about taking that um, disruptive event, that critical incident, and slowly starting to move across time back to business as usual. So the recovery of key functions, but also the replacement training and communication to staff and customers, so you can bring your business back on track and be operating where you were prior to the incident. So that's the first thing that I like to, um, to work with because when I start to reference some of these terms, I really want to put some, a visual representation of where we are at from a critical incident through emergency and moving our way through to that crisis level. If you do have any questions to this, Joe's um, told us that you can type your questions out and we will answer them um, as we get to the end of the, uh, um, uh, end of the session. Sorry, Tim. No, no, I was going to ask you a question. So I'm just, you mentioned that time between um, the start of the incident and when that haystack, that yellow haystack uh, starts, the incident and crisis management, that could be, it could be minutes, but it, it could be hours. Ab absolutely. And um, one of the things that we will always say to any of our clients or, or any of uh, the people that we're speaking to is you actually can't template an event. Yeah. Um, one of the core principles that we would always um, ask you to, to adhere to is that concept of assessment. Because if you've had, um, and again, I'll, I'll touch wood as I go through this, uh, this webinar today, but if you've had, let's just say, a vehicle crash involving one of your staff or some of your customers, and you try to template that against another vehicle crash in a different country, in a different environment, with, uh, with a whole deep, a heap of different cultural uh, considerations, you can actually come unstuck really, really quickly. So it's not just about the timeline being different, it's a whole range of different events being being really different in terms of how quickly you can solve it and the information that's coming to you as well. Um, so what does crisis ready look like? From a risk logic position, and it is a fairly busy slide, we like to think of it in terms of a pyramid with um, business as usual being at the bottom. And this is where you do think about your standing operating procedures, standard operating procedures. So for anybody from an after perspective, this is the pre-briefs, this is the, um, the communications to your clients before they go away. It's also about, um, um, about understanding what your risk tolerances and thresholds are through your enterprise or your organizational risk assessment. So really understanding what is on your risk register, what you're happy to deal with, and um, where your thresholds are that you either need to escalate or you need to start putting other um, mitigations in place to deal with those particular risks. Once we actually move up from that level zero business as usual, this is where we are talking about a disruption. So from a tactical response, this is where I would then start talking about emergency management plans. And we talk about running drills, um, uh, and this is from a travel agent or operator perspective, where we are genuinely talking about training your on the ground staff to deal with the preservation of life and property for your particular organization. So for tour directors or, um, or um, even if it's the contracted staff that are driving your buses or conducting your tours, this is where you want to know what that first response is going to be and start to build drills and products around what that looks like. As soon as you then move up to level two, which we've designated operational response, this is the whole concept of incident management um, and business continuity. Now you'll note in here, um, for those of you that are looking at the screen, in the bottom left-hand corner of those icons, in the red level, you'll also see things like ITDR plans and cyber. And I'm going to address that from a risk perspective for you coming up in the next couple of slides. But this is about assessing what's going on, but the operational response. So from your industry, what we've seen here is um, where you would then potentially forward deploy somebody to support people on the ground or activating managers and support um, uh, resources around communications to be able to really respond operationally. 
The final piece, which is the strategic response, is about that crisis management. Now, by definition, crisis management is about the strategic market position and the strategic future of your organisation. So if you've had an event that has had that level of disruption to your particular company, your particular business, um, or the industry as a whole, this is where you need to come together and start to not worry about what has happened, but start to forecast about what could happen and mitigate against those particular threats um, with the actions that you take going forward from there. So crisis management is strategic, incident management is operational, and emergency management is really um, that tactical level of response. So what are we actually dealing with within your industry and across the globe? Now, what I've put up on the screen here is the World Economic Forum releases every year the Global Risk Report. Um, and it's actually fascinating to think about the travel industry is completely impacted by the five top threats um, that the Global Risk Report has actually pushed out this year. Extreme weather, climate change or failure to mitigate against climate change, natural disasters, and then we come into four and five, which is this concept of data for fraud or theft and cyber attacks. Now, when we talk about number four, and this is where I want to take it a little bit away from that immediate, um, what we think of the grey rhino events, where we see these events all the time with your customers, where people are being injured or might lose something and might call you up and see what your response is. But one of the things that is probably more likely these days from a global perspective is actually the loss of client data. And that's something that domestically you really need to think about because there is, um, the, the Australian Information Commission has put very, very clear uh, policies and procedures that if you lose data, um, or client data or staff data, and that is compromised in any way, shape or form, you've actually got 30 days to respond to that and failure to do so can have an absolutely strategic effect on not only your rep reputation, but also financially on your business with fines and, uh, and restrictions, et cetera. And then the last one is also cyber attack, which kind of links into that a little bit as well. But when we actually think about the risks, if I think about your industry, the fact that I raised at the start of this webinar that it's not about if this will happen, it's when this will happen. We've seen over the last couple of weeks and months volcanoes in Indonesia. We've seen escalating violence in Hong Kong and uh, throughout, uh, throughout Asia there, but also moving back to um, those, those events that we have unfortunately seen, like the bus crash in Portugal in April, but we've seen severe weather globally starting to impact on your, your particular industry as well. So although I've defined these as the top five risks in terms of impact, we also know that there is a series of other um, uh, events that have occurred that you may have had to have responded to recently. So what have we learned as risk logic um, about your industry and what are we actually seeing? So I've put a couple of, um, of lessons there, but I'd also like to open with a number of trends that aren't on the screen. The first trend that I'd like to speak about is that within the crisis management um, response spectrum um, of how organisations are responding, we have actually absolutely seen from the public a lack of tolerance for failure. So it doesn't matter if you're a small business or a large business, um, the public scrutiny of things um, that have gone wrong and a management response to that event is absolutely changing where organisations, both small and large, are being held to account by the Australian public or the, or the uh, population globally about how they responded. And you can only um, have to look at the news recently, um, not just your, in your industry, but um, even Swimming Australia about the Shane and Jack thing overnight are being completely targeted by the public and the media about how they responded to that particular event. We've also seen a massive increase in the speed of reporting and expectation. Now, a couple of years ago, if there was an event and someone posted something on social media, we probably would have um, thought, okay, well, that's their opinion or that's their comment. But these days, we can't think about social media being anything other than another brand of media, where we're seeing um, one person's post being picked up by mainstream media, and they're taking that as fact, and we're having to respond um, to it. And unfortunately, the last trend that we've seen is a failure to activate teams or support resources early in event. And unfortunately, that comes down to a definition of um, their escalation points. So if you've got a tour director, if you've got one of your staff on the ground, if they don't know when to call through to your management um, uh, levels, 
then potentially you won't find out about events until hours or potentially days after, and you may be always on the back foot. So that clear escalation becomes really important. And I'll address that in my final slides. So to go to the slide that's up on the screen at the moment, one of the things that we have learnt is that you, you as travel operators and agents need to have an absolute depth in capability because it's not always going to be your, um, your organisational leaders or the senior members of the organisation that are going to have to deal with these events. So what we absolutely recommend there is training down through levels. And I can tell you from first-hand experience and very unfortunately um, working through an organisation who... Um, as I said, very unfortunately, from a case study perspective, had two students in the mosque in Christchurch um, in March. And it wasn't the general manager dealing with that. It wasn't the owner. It wasn't the manager. It ended up being, if you actually go down through the chain, not the, even the two I see, but the third person in charge, just because people were not in the office or not available to deal with that particular event. Geographically, the dispersed teams is also a really big issue from the travel industry, not just because your main office may be domestic here in Australia, and therefore, again, having travel operators or having resources overseas, including, including your contacts in the resorts and to, uh, travel uh, identities that you are actually sending people to. The third problem there is that you will not always be able to own the problem. For you, if you've got clients, customers, staff overseas, your requirement to liaise with local government or foreign organisations is absolute. So if you don't have clear expectations about what your role is, if you're already starting behind on what the expectation for you to, to actually move forward is. And that aligns completely with that last point, with specific location challenges around language, culture, the distance and time zone that you need to take into consideration. So starting to wrap up from our perspective, what does Crisis Ready absolutely look like within the travel industry? Um, we, we believe that from a tour operator or an agency, you absolutely need to have a policy and framework. From a travel organisation, this gets buy-in from the, um, the executive leadership or the board, and that could be for smaller organisations, just the owner or managing director setting their absolute expectations for the organisation of how you will respond in a disruption. We then start to move down through that crisis management plan, and that's where we really think strategically about not just what you need to do to forecast those impacts and those actions, but also liaise at the right level with the government or other organisations. We then start to move down through that incident response, which is about two leaders on the ground, and that's where you understand what your local emergency service interaction may be, and what Tim's going to discuss. We've also put in there communications and team support. When we start to talk about um, uh, travel, ver sorry, uh, travel or overseas response versus domestic, this is where we tie into that last point, which is the whole concept of IT DRP as well, which is um, IT disaster response plans. So one of the biggest threats that I start to see domestically is if you've got a number of different outlets um, or a number, number of different agencies and you're all aligned on the same IT systems, what is your response time? Because if you're doing everything through your IT system and you have an outage of 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, you've got the IT DRP, but that should be supported and nested within your incident response, standard operating procedures, and also your crisis management plan as a whole. So to tie that in together, to build resilience, we, we always would um, encourage you to reflect on your own culture. Because if you try to template a solution or template a plan, you can come on stuff really, really quickly. So match your plans, match your organisation um, to the culture that you have. Training should be um, not only about the plan, and as I said, go down a number of levels, but it should also incorporate the types of things that you expect your staff to do. And within the travel industry, one of the types of trainings that we've raised, training that we've raised before is family liaison training. Because if you've had a serious injury or, again, touch wood, if you've had a death um, within one of your clients or your staff, yes, local government organisations or state police may be the, uh, the people that need to make that next of kin announcement um, and inform the next of kin of that loss. But I can guarantee that there's an expectation that you're going to be the next call. When you actually start to validate that plan, that's not just about training, but that's exercising and putting a scenario against it, making sure that you're actually working through and bringing that, that training, bringing those plans to life and finally maintaining it. Because for any of those people that are listening today, I can guarantee if I go back two years or five years, 
yoga organisations and the environment has changed dramatically. So being able to revisit those plans and keep them up to date and maintain them to a point of currency becomes really important for you within this, um, within this industry. So closing off for me, what do I see as your key success factors? Pre-incident, understanding what your roles and responsibilities are, understanding what tools and processes are available to your organisation, and then train and exercise them to build confidence and capability within your organisations. When we talk about the incident itself, or the crisis or the event, it is about how you're going to process that information, how you're going to communicate effectively up, down, in and out of the organisation, and then how you're going to delegate across different roles of management. So that's a really nice segue as I talk about communication being a key success factor to hand over to my colleague Tim Archer to talk about the communications component. Thanks Simon, that's uh, such a great overview and a very uh, succinct 20 minute overview of, of what you do and uh, there's a lot to be learned and a lot you can drill down from there and obviously communications is just one part of it and and before I get underway, I just want to reflect on the fact that I know we've got some large organisations here. You might have quite an experienced communications team or communications and marketing team, uh, down to smaller operators who might have one person that does a, a lot of different functions, including communications, and uh, others there may have no communications function at all. So just bear with me on this. I'll address that uh, at the end. Uh, so when I, I refer to communication teams or, or functions, I, I'm, I'm very conscious that everyone's different on this call. Um, I want to have a look at uh, the common reasons crisis communications can fail, and I'm not going to spend the whole time looking at failure because uh, that, that's not great, but we can learn from people's mistakes, and, and learning from other people's mistakes is, is cheap, and it's easy, and it doesn't involve any risk for us, so it is a really uh, good way to learn. So. I see about five common reasons for, for failure in this space, and the first one is lack of preparation. Uh, it comes down to not having a good quality crisis communications plan already locked and loaded. Uh, it's either poor quality or actually doesn't exist at all, which we see a lot. Knowledge can be locked inside the head of, of uh, individuals. Uh, again, if you've got a communications team and you might have that the leader of that team, all the knowledge is inside their head about how we would respond in a crisis. but if that person is away that day or on leave or on a plane, uh, you, you need the wider team, uh, wider communications uh, functions or, or uh, support staff to be trained and exercised in the ability to roll out a good plan uh, well. So the second one it relates to pressure and I, I think we all know it's pretty obvious that when a crisis hits there is a major spike and it, it can really impact on people and uh, sometimes the best in, in people comes out in a crisis, but sometimes the worst. And, but the bottom line is your business or your communication function is, is not staffed at a level that uh, suits a crisis. It's staffed at a level, level that suits business as usual. So when you've got a crisis impact, the workload just goes through the roof. And, and sometimes we see that events overtake the, the actual physical ability of those people to respond. And when you add those first two factors, lack of preparation and, and pressure, well, that, that just causes stress. And uh, we know stress clouds your vision and does, uh, does very bad things to your decision-making ability. So uh, I often say that in this situation, some people uh, can be like a water molecule and either freeze or melt down or, or completely evaporate. And, and that's what you don't want in your in your comms function, you want someone who is well drilled and well practiced and, and exercised in this space. This is a really important slide about a lack of communication strategy and, and I, I do harp on this a little bit when I talk to our clients about the, the how easy it is to go straight to the tactical response when a crisis uh, unfolds and and everyone knows that they've got to rush out a holding statement and get on the front foot and start communicating, or most people do, Others, um, some can run a mile from it, but uh, it's really important to, before you start communicating, take a short period of time to step back and frame the issue and fr frame the situation, understand what's involved and what your strategic objectives are. Uh, because if you don't do that, it's very easy to get stuck in the trenches and, and start fighting this battle from the trenches and not from the helicopter. So 
You need to step back, take that, that bird's eye view on the situation and define your communication strategy. Because if you don't, you, you can end up on the left side of this list of being in the trenches dealing with tactical and micro issues and being reactive and constantly chasing your tail rather than taking that, that wider view and being strategic and proactive. So lack of strategy, and we'll talk about how to come up with a good strategy shortly. Speed or lack of, the hare and the tortoise, so you can either be too fast or too slow. And, and like Simon said before, you, you can't template these situations. Every situation is different. I see people on social media saying that uh, prescripting that you must have your first holding statement out 15 minutes after a crisis breaks and so forth. Uh, that, that's all very well, but every situation is different. And, uh, and the, the, there are reasons why organisations can be too slow. Uh, maybe they don't have the systems and the processes in place uh, or they, they wait until the full picture is known before they think that they can communicate. Well, we don't know everything, so we can't say anything. And, and that can uh, get you into a bit of a trap. Uh, or too fast, like I said before, racing out with, with tactics uh, that could be a knee-jerk reaction and be based on, on poor decision making. Stakeholders often get forgotten. And, and funnily enough, in a crisis, the noisiest ones are often the ones that get fed first. So I'm talking about um, media and social media. We all know we've got to be uh, fast to deal with those uh, stakeholders and get messaging out. And of course, your customers and, and shareholders, and major stakeholders, uh, you know, that's, that's where the bread is buttered. So you communicate to them. And if you're doing a good job, you're also communicating to your own staff. I often see in exercises that we do, Simon, is that uh, that can be the full extent of a, of a communications uh, response. And that's really thinking about more of a, a media and social media uh, strategy. But this is, you need to be putting in place a wider stakeholder strategy, a full stakeholder strategy. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think it's really interesting, Tim, um, to note about the exercises that we have run, especially um, in, your, in the uh, travel industry as well, that it, it does only take a couple of really negative social media comments that if the senior management or the senior leadership of that organisation get a hold of those and continue to read them, um, this is where we you do get sucked into that social media cycle and it can completely derail your message if you're starting to respond to individuals. Um, and we've seen that uh, not just within the travel industry but uh, across uh, different industries as well. Absolutely. Uh, so stakeholders that get forgotten, um, there's a whole bunch of them that, that we see often get forgotten, regulators, sponsors, partners, and so forth. So, uh, and I, I put up the minister there, or ministers get forgotten, and, and your industry, more than many others, uh, with uh, uh, tourism industries and foreign affairs, uh, sorry, tourism ministers and foreign affairs ministers, um, at any given time, there'll always be a politician in front of a microphone. And if they've just heard about an incident, and, uh, and they haven't been briefed on it, haven't got the latest information, they've got a very good chance of possibly exacerbating the situation uh, to your detriment. So uh, briefing your, all your stakeholders is really critical. So in looking at those mistakes, let's look at how to mitigate against doing that or, or do it in a best practice fashion. And I, I really, um, this almost mirrors what Simon was saying about assessing, stabilising and remedying the situation. So the first piece of work is that, that communication strategy that I said so many uh, organisations do forget to do. It's five questions to do that, and I'll, I'll touch on those questions shortly. This, this is not about sitting down and spending two or three hours writing a communication strategy. Uh, it, it's about spending maybe 10 or 15 minutes to frame the issue, step back, take that strategic helicopter view, and, uh, and determine what your objectives are from your, for your communication. Now, in parallel to that, at the same time, you can also be preparing your stabilising communications, your holding statement, key messages, frequently asked questions, and, and possibly a media release if that's what you choose to do. So in the first 60 minutes, this, uh, this work can be happening in parallel, and once you've determined your strategy, that's when you press the go button on your uh, on your actual communications. Uh, and then the third phase is to remedy. And really, I see that as all the tactics that you can use, once you've determined your strategy, all those tactical options that you can use to uh, ensure that your message reaches all your stakeholders in a timely fashion. 
Uh, now, I've, I've got hub and spoke model up there. That might make uh, sense to some people. That's where you, you're putting your information, your key messages right in the center of your um, wheel. Uh, and the spokes on the wheel are your uh, channels for communication, all the different channels that you can use and your stakeholders are on the outside, on the ribbon, rim of that wheel. And it's really important in a crisis situation to ensure that hub, that source of, uh, of your key messages, is a single source of truth. And this is where Simon and I have, we've got different terminology here. <laughs> I, I say single source of truth. Uh, I use common operating picture, I think. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it's, it's one of the same thing. It, it, it's that common picture that we know this is the latest information. So you're not writing different information for different stakeholders. You put it all in the middle and use that to, uh, to get your message out to those stakeholders. So the five questions to determine that strategy. Uh, do we own it? That's a really important first question. Uh, you don't want to race into an issue you don't own, nor do you want to sit back and think, well, this is someone else's problem. And sometimes the answer to that question is a very clear yes or a very clear no but often it's a bit of in between and there's a bit of a maybe happening there. Uh, we, we partially own it. We weren't responsible for it, uh, but you know what? We really have to communicate to our stakeholders because we're in the middle of this. And uh, you know, that, a terrorism event can be a good example. Like we, we didn't own it, we, don't, we, we didn't cause it, but gee, we've got to communicate because of it. And I think this becomes really important within the travel industry because if there's a serious event that involves people, it often does involve emergency services or other government agencies, both domestically and, and overseas. And what we see here in Australia to, to address that very clearly is if there's um, any type of accident involving people, if it's serious and it involves a death, um, again, touch wood, but that's where police will own that particular issue and they'll also own the initial communications about that. We talked about communicating with families, that's one point, but they also own the communications around uh, potential causes and yeah. um, the potential first response as well. Now, Tim, I know one of the things that you and I discussed before this was also, and, and whether or not you address it now or later, was about starting to brief our on the ground um, people, so tour directors or um, or uh, the, the, the common role, about whether or not they are um, able to or eligible to to make that comment. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, uh, and that comes on to spokespeople that we'll, we'll talk about, but let, let's talk about it now because tour, tour directors, uh, I used to work as a media manager to New South Wales Police and, and so we, in, in a major uh, incident where people are death and destruction, we own the, or the police own the communications, but that's not to say you can't communicate. Yep. You just can't cut across what police are doing. You stick to their messages and, and you defer those tough questions about uh, causes and, and effects uh, to police and the, and the emergency services, but you, that doesn't mean you can't communicate your own messaging. And those two directors, uh, uh, I'd be interested in, in policies that, that um, the various members of AFTA have in relation to who is your authorised spokesperson. Is it someone back at head office or is there a delegated authority for your tour directors to talk to local media on the ground uh, in a uh, situation like this? I've hazard a guess it could be different for each organisation, um, but it's an important point. Now, if your tour directors aren't authorised to speak to the media, I, and I understand that because you want a, a good, consistent uh, corporate message, Use those tour directors as your source of information. Mm. Your comms person desperately needs eyes and ears on the ground, feeding them back uh, information to, to help uh, come up with the strategy and the messaging. And you know what, in, in a crisis, sometimes in adversity, there's also opportunity. Mm. And your tour director may have a, a hidden gold nugget to say, well, the bus driver pulled you know, four, four people off the bus, probably saved their lives. So you might have death and destruction and it's never a good story, but uh, media are also sometimes after a silver lining in these things. And so just a good flow of information from your tour director back into your crisis management team and into your comms person is, is really critical. And I think um, just, just um, in terms of addressing this question particularly, especially for the travel agents over here, it is going to be a really clear indication of where your responsibilities end from a communication. So when you send people on these trips, where does the responsibility of the agent finish 
and the, um, the area or the, the place that they're going start to come up. So if it's a resort, is it going to be the resort or the, the destination that's going to pick up that messaging? And do you have to, if you've got clients or customers there, do you even have to play into it because that ownership yeah. becomes really important? Yeah, and I talk about deflecting and deflecting responsibility is, a, you've got to do it carefully yep. if, it, if you don't own it, but you're certainly impacted by it. Uh, and you do want to, shift uh, the focus over onto a different organization maybe, you do it carefully. You don't just sort of point over there and say, well, that's their fault. We've got nothing to do with it. You've still got to look after your stakeholders. So anyway, do we own it? That's an important question and sometimes not a simple answer. Who are the most critically impacted stakeholders? So again, this comes back to that previous slide about forgotten stakeholders. Don't forget your key stakeholders, those um, not only customers, but those, those influencers who could just post on social media that they haven't heard from uh, your organization to, to give you an update and that can majorly derail your communication strategy. What are the story ingredients? Now this is a, a, a bit of a strange question but it, it relates to all those factors around well what's in this story because a story needs certain components to give it life. Like, um, so what is the level of coverage that's happening here? Who are the voices in the story? The voices in the story means who's talking about it? Who, who saw it? Who, who's an authority on this? Because uh, often if you don't talk about it, then someone else will do it for you. And also an old adage I always say, in the absence of information, people assume the worst. So oh, I should have said that up front actually. But some of these other ingredients might be, uh, are we uh, a victim or a culprit or are we a bit of both? And data breaches are a good example of that. What's the likely duration of this event? Um, what's our track record? Is this the first time it's happened or, or it's, uh, it happened just uh, two years ago and, and that's going to influence the story? So an important question. Who's our spokesperson? Uh, we've, we've touched on that. Uh, really important to ensure that your spokesperson is regularly trained. Uh, it's a performance art, so it requires uh, regular rehearsal. Uh, and do you go straight to your CEO or do you go one step down and protect your CEO? And that's a decision, a very strategic decision based on, on how high you want to go. But uh, if you don't have your spokesperson trained and ready to go, you don't be sticking them in front of the camera. And, for, and that, by asking those questions, it, it, that helps lead you to that strategy. What are our objectives? Are we going to harness every uh, communications channel that there is available and, and get our message out to the largest possible audience? Or if in a different issue, you might be able to uh, get to your stakeholders directly because you've got all their email addresses, you don't need to harness the media or social media. Every uh, situation is different, but that comes back to um, your, your strategy. So, talking about spokespeople, now this is a bit insensitive for this poor guy, but um, I always say a good media spokesperson is fat and like CCs. Yeah? Okay. It sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? But yep. uh, a fat uh, spokesperson who likes CCs, and it, it, it's insensitive, but it's very easy to memorize. And it's all about being factual, accurate, transparent, and truthful. <laughs> And then on the other side, calm and in control, consistent and confident. And look, empathetic doesn't fit into a good acronym, but I've got to say it is the most uh, important thing, especially uh, when dealing with issues that the travel industry has to do with, uh, with mayhem and destruction, uh, darkening your door. So um, like I say, make sure your uh, media spokesperson is, is well trained. Uh, okay, stakeholder mapping, I'll touch on just looking at the time. We've got about five minutes and I think we're running on time. Uh, so stakeholder mapping is, is not about just listing who your stakeholders are. So this is not a stakeholder map. This is just a list of possible stakeholders. Uh, but if a crisis happened today, do you have the contact details, the email addresses, the mobile phone numbers for each of these people, their, their names, their titles, do you know who the, uh, the chief of staff for the tourism in, uh, minister is? Can you get to them quickly or, or the comms manager? Uh, so a stakeholder map is, is pretty much putting every possible stakeholder down on paper with their contact de details and importantly, having a relationship manager with that person. The comms, per, uh, comms manager or the, the comms function isn't always that point of contact with, with each of these uh, stakeholders, but who is? 
because when, when you need to reach them, who in your organisation is going to do that reaching out to those stakeholders? And uh, Tim, I think it's important, especially for, for the agents that are out there and also some of the smaller operators. Yes, we've got some really big um, stakeholders mm. that are up on the screen, but it's also um, understanding within your own organisation who those stakeholders are, especially if you've franchised um, an agency. Um, you might um, have a single point of contact back to that particular um, group, etc. But understanding that if that phone, uh, you need to pick up that phone, if you can't get onto that single point of contact, who's your alternate? Have you actually practiced that call and, and understood what those expectations of some of those stakeholders are as well? When we actually start to go down into that, that detail in terms of the customer or consumer groups, but also, um, again, for those smaller, um, smaller uh, agents or operators out there, it's also starting to link through, through that crisis and through the stakeholders of who you will need at different stages. So where does that link into the business continuity plan? Do you need to activate alternate bus resources or transport? Um, uh, if you need to call overseas, if for whatever reason that, that particular um, number isn't picking up, do you know somebody else in the region that might be closer than what you are and can get to the site faster than you can? Mm. And so there's all of these different stakeholders that go all the way, as, as Tim has indicated here, up to government level, all the way down to local providers. Mm. And we're not asking for every local provider or small operator to get the minister's number. You're not going to be able to get that, but it's understanding what's important to you for your stakeholder map. Yeah, and look, uh, I'd also just say on, on stakeholder relations, you know, you, you don't want to be talking to your stakeholders for the first time in a crisis. You say you should be doing this work already. Uh, okay, so what else have we got here? Now, this comes down to a crisis communications team, and, and some of you may be rolling your eyes and going, I don't even have a, a comms function. Uh, this team, this business about a team, well, that's Nirvana, <laughs> and, and I do understand that. Uh, but I guess what I'm putting up here is, is a model for all the, all the different things, all the different functions within comms that need to be thought about uh, at, in a business as usual time and in a crisis time. Uh, so it, I guess it, it's really important here to be talking about um, if, you're, if you're a large organisation, have this team formalised and trained and exercised in, in how to respond with your crisis communication plan and uh, liaising with your crisis management team if you do have that formalised. So for the, for the bigger organisations, don't stop your training uh, at, at that executive level. Ensure all your comms team knows exactly what they're doing uh, and what their roles and responsibilities are. And Tim, for the smaller organisations, um, it's it's also um, it is also about cross training as well. Would you recommend some of that? Yeah, that's a good point, Simon. You've uh, predicted my next slide. <laughs> Your comms team might equal one person, uh, yeah. who and it may be that comms isn't actually their their speciality. So, what my recommendation is for those uh, organisations is do do the hard work before a crisis hits. Do all that, uh, the planning before it hits. Uh, and I, I say that with a good crisis communications plan, you can do about 75% of that work, all that heavy lifting pre-crisis, so that when it does hit, uh, the, the volume of work is less and you've got all those tools and templates and checklists and pre-approved messaging and holding statements. They're all there ready to go. And for a, a sole operator, that makes life much easier. Uh, but having a bench of pinch hitters, uh, absolutely. So maybe you've got one or two comms and marketing people and in a crisis, every crisis situation, the comms team gets hammered. There's no doubt about that. But other parts of your organisation uh, may not be so busy. So you can borrow people and get this uh, pre-approved, all authorised well ahead of a crisis that you can pull in someone from the HR team or from the sales desk or uh, for, from uh, marketing or, or other areas, or legal, for example, that can just lend a hand to comms just for that 24 or 48 hours to get them through that spike. So, um, because, because I guess we're not talking business as usual, are we? No, absolutely. <laughs> no, that, that's right. So, so con people from those areas, they, they won't be as busy as comms and, uh, and throw them into things. Uh, and look, get external help. We, we would always say that, but... Um, that's what we do, and uh, I won't go into a blatant plug here, but uh, 
certainly if you need help, then then reach out because it's so much better to do that well before a crisis than than trying to, uh, like I say, don't don't try and build your ark uh, when the flood has already arrived. Yep. So, look, I think that's about it. Uh, we're certainly happy to take questions. Actually, I've got one more slide, and then we'll, then we'll hit questions. And this is this is my my plea to all the business owners and managing directors and and uh, directors who are on this call, put your comms people right in your inner circle. There's there's nothing worse than working in comms uh, and you're not fully in the loop on everything because uh, it just puts you on the back foot. If, if your comms people know about things in advance, they can get a head start on things. If they don't know until everyone else knows, then they'll be absolutely on the back foot and that's, uh, that's something that will impact on, on your reputation and your communications response. And please, don't think that comms can sort of comms your way out of a crisis. But they need an operational response. They need something tangible to work with. They can't just put out a media release and, and everything will, will be hunky-dory. But um, look, that's about it. I, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you for your time. Very keen to hear your questions because this is what it's about, what's, uh, what's relevant to you. So um, yeah, I'll hand back over to Joe to uh, see if there's any questions going. Well, fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. It's really great to have some topic experts here to introduce us to the concept of risk management. Uh, and I think what I'd like to say is when it comes to stakeholders, don't forget AFTA. Because, <laughs> you know, we are your representative body and we are a fantastic gateway to ministers, to um, consulate, to DFAT, uh, and of course the different tourism organisations um, where the crisis might be happening in, in that particular destination. So yeah. we're there to support you. And often we get a heads up about something that's happening before yeah. it even it hits the media as well. So Of course. And so, you've got some good comms expertise. So. Well, I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, are there any questions uh, for either Tim or Simon? Um, please feel free to write that in the toolbox that you have. And of course, if we're too shy to ask questions, you can drop us an email um, and we can build that out to the guys. Yeah. Yeah. And if uh, I think you'll be making this available afterwards. So if your colleagues, if there's some colleagues that you think yeah, should have uh, been on uh, online watching this, uh, we, you can watch it later on the website. Definitely. Yeah. So we should have this up online within the next 48 hours. Okay. All right. No, I'm, um, fr from my perspective, I think just to, to wrap up, um, if there isn't any questions, it is, it is absolutely all about um, that confidence and that capability as we start to move um, forward. I, um, like even when we talk about other government agencies and DFAT, um, from a risk, a risk logic perspective, we've been fortunate enough now, we're working with all the um, consulates and embassies through South, South Pacific. We're actually training their staff in crisis management Amazing. to respond. So we're getting a really good understanding of where their limits are as well. And I can tell you from their perspective, there is uh, an absolute reliance on the, the tour operator or the people that have the knowledge about um, the individuals who are traveling to support that. Um, because we all know we'd love to, for everybody to jump on and do smart travel, but it's not what everybody yeah, does. Yeah. So. But I think it's a good point. As an organization, and, uh, you should, you know, sending people to destinations, you should be registered with Smart Traveller so that you can keep across um, what's happening in the destination that you specialise in um, and can be on the front foot and tell your clients if there is a change in status, like don't travel. Um, so that's really important as well. Okay. Great. Well, it looks like you did a great webinar. It's obviously <laughs> very comprehensive because we have no questions. So I just want to thank you both again for your time. Um, and of course, guys, thank you for joining our webinar today. Please feel free to uh, ask us any questions and please do complete that post webinar survey that will be in your inbox shortly. So thank you. All right, thanks thanks very much.